I have spent my life in the United States uh, studying the Soviet Union. I have always lived very far from home. And in many ways, this project is a way of going home via Russia. So um, I'm in very early stages of this project and I look forward to feedback from you. So who is Shanta Rama Rao? Not anybody very important. I didn't even know she existed um, until my colleague Lynn Malley, who wrote on Halle Flanagan um, and her work with the Soviet theater, she gave me the book, uh, My Journey to Russia. And when I started reading it, I assumed it was something written by somebody from India. I didn't pay any attention to it until recently. And I realized that this book played an important role in Soviet American relations, strangely enough, not in uh, Soviet Indo-Soviet uh, Indo relations. So who was Shanta Rama Rao? She was born um, to a very, very eminent Indian family. Um, her father was uh, knighted, um, Sir Benegal uh, Rama Rao. He was an economist, he was a diplomat, he was the first ambassador to Japan. So she was there with him in, in occupied Japan. And I think she learned a lot about imperialism from that. Um, she was educated in Oxford and then in Wellesley and uh, subsequently most of her life was spent in the United States. Um, her mother was a uh, very much uh, a Soviet lady in, in terms of the 1930s Stalinist ideas of womanhood. She was a public figure. She didn't care much about her home. Um, she spent her life fighting for various causes in India. That's why she sent her children abroad to study. She was president of the International Planned Parenthood. And I think for Shantarama Rao, it was hard for her to have these two very um, accomplished parents. And she was trying to find her identity in between all of this. Um, there is her father, Sir Benegal Rama Rao, a very accomplished economist and diplomat. And you can see from his stern face and her smiling face, um, the generation difference between them. Um, Benegal Rama Rao and his wife, um, were elite Indians who fought passionately for the independence of India, spent their life in social work and social service. Um, Shanta Ramarao was definitely the odd person out. She could not commit to work in India and she tried to find a new way of being a woman during this era. And I think part of her work comes from this context. She then married somebody like her father, uh, Fabian Bowers. Um, he was a gay man um, and he was openly gay about it, but they did have a child, uh, J. Peters Bowers. And Fabian Bowers was an autodidact. Um, he knew many, many languages, including Russian. He was a deeply cultured man. He wrote one of the best biographies of uh, Alexander Skriabin, which today nobody's written a better biography. Um, he taught himself all the way from uh, Japanese, Malay, um, Russian, of course. And again, I think Shanta Rama Rao, who was also a novelist, could never match his cultural expertise. So there she was caught between a very accomplished mother, a very accomplished father, and a very accomplished husband. And how do you define yourself in these contexts? Um, I want to start with a consideration of travelogues. Um, are travelogues historical sources? How do we use travelogues? Um, because as we know, um, travelogues are not true. Travelogues are fictional um, texts. Travelogues can represent and misrepresent. And the politics of the travelogues becomes much more important than the text itself. More recently, we tend to study authors, not as individuals, but as a way um, to look at categories such as class, education, race. Race is becoming a very important category in the United States, as you know. And of course, national, and I would argue transnational identity. But given all these structural categories of analysis, I think it is very, very important that we trace the individual in this context. Sometimes the structural categories of analysis overwhelm the 
individual. And I would argue that it's important that we also keep in mind that there is an individual, despite the fact we historians like structural analysis. And finally, how do we trace the individual in the context of international relations? Because we know power exists in many, many vectors and in international relations is perhaps the hardest for women to find a voice. And then how do we place Shantarama Rao, a minor novelist, a product of a very elite background, how do we place her in the context and which context? And that's where I'm having trouble because Shantarama Rao was an Indian woman who traveled to Russia as part of an American cultural offensive. But at the same time, the Indianness is also was part of our identity. So in this uh, presentation, I will offer two interpretations of Rao and hopefully my audience will give me some more ideas of how to develop this article. Um, please feel free to interrupt me with questions um, because it, it is much easier to ask, uh, answer questions in real time. Now, when I started the project, I did a deep dive into Indo-Russian relations because I was not aware that she was part of the Eisenhower Cultural Offensive. And I realized that there were two ways that India connected to Russia. One was through the Northwestern frontier, Pakistan, what is modern day Pakistan, Afghanistan, Persia, Armenia into Southern Russia. And we know Afanasy Nikitin in the 15th century, he came to India, he set up trade relations and many, many Indians followed. They set up communities in places like Tashkent, um, Aryanburg, um, um, and Astrakhan, the most important, there was an Indian community over there in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And Indian traders were present in Nizhny Novgorod. They were even uh, traveled all the way up to Arkhangelsk. So this Western uh, trade passage was an important component of Indo-Russian relations. Subsequently, when late 19th century, the Russian revolutionary ideas started traveling, they came to India, not just from the West, but through the Western passage of India. So they basically traveled from Afghanistan into what was British India, the Northwest Frontier Project. The other thing that is important to consider is that socialism merged with pan-Islamism. So this was another corridor that we really don't pay much attention to, but was extremely important in shaping Indian understanding of Russia. And finally, um, for many, many nationalist fighters in British India, the way to escape the law was to travel from the Northwest frontier into Afghanistan, into Central Asia, to Moscow, and from Moscow to the West. So that passage was open as late as the 1930s. Um, 1941, Shubhash Chandra Bose um, travels from, through this passage to Moscow, goes to Berlin, and builds an army to, find, uh, to fight the British with the help of the Nazis. So this passage was open till about the 1940s after the Second World War, this passage is completely closed naturally with the birth of, of Pakistan. Now, if India is connected to Russia through Western India, there's another connection through Western Europe, right? And Indian radicals in the late 19th century and the early 20th century in London, Paris, and Berlin met Russian nihilists. They learned how to make bombs and they learned about the Russian radical movement and they were deeply inspired by it. So, so Vera Figner's uh, autobiography was translated into Hindi. It was, of course, translated into English first. And there were these seminal texts, you know, Chernyshevsky. These texts really shaped the Indian independence movement in ways that we really haven't done the research. The other great uh, Russian influence was, of course, Russian literature. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Gorky. Gorky was incredibly popular in India um, until very recently, but I think uh, uh, Tolstoy was, was just the favorite, right? And people are still reading him. But this came to us through 
English translation. So you must remember for us, Russia was not Russia, Russia was a part of Europe. The other things, and I will skip over this quickly and get to my talk is of course, the Bolshevik revolution of 1917 and Lenin's thesis on the national and colonial questions, which was so, so important. It brought together the independence movement against European imperialism and socialism in ways that we are still trying to figure it out. Um, it was very, very important. Subsequently, of course, um, Soviet modernity, the prototype of Soviet modernity had great impact on post-colonial nations. Um, the idea of the planned economy, technology transfer, educational exchanges, military ties, um, the list goes on and there's certainly a lot of literature on this. And finally, I also want to say that there was a Russian tradition of interest in Asia, especially in India, although under Stalin, many of these people were killed, but that has continued the interest in um, Russian, in Indian history, Indian art, Indian religion. And at the same time, there is a popular connection as well. Bollywood films and music, um, the beach culture of India and the drug culture, yoga and ISKCON, these are some of the ways that Russians have reciprocated interest in, in India. But Shantarama Rao, I could not find her in this literature. It is as if she did not exist. It is as if the people who study Russian-American relations, I wrote to many of them, no one knew who Shantarama Rao was. And that was very surprising for me. So then it got very interesting. Then who was Shantarama Rao? If she is not perceived as part of Indo-Russian relations, where do we find her? When I started digging a little deeper, um, it was really her husband who stood out. As I said, Forbian Bowers was very important in not just the Eisenhower administration, as all of you know, um, starting with the uh, Soviet Youth Festival in Moscow under Khrushchev, the Americans reciprocated by what they called a cultural offensive, right? The smuggling out of Buddy's Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago to the West, the publication in the West, this was part, this was the cultural Cold War where Russian culture and American culture became so inextricably tied and Americans wanted to believe that they were saving Russian culture from the oppressive Soviet state. So this is a very, very important, and Alan Dallas, who was head of the CIA, Frank Wisner, who was in charge of the uh, Soviet division, both of these people well understood the role culture plays in, in not just destabilizing a society, but in also in imperialism, I would argue. And Fabian Bowers was the perfect person because he had served as the ADC to General MacArthur in Japan. That is where Shantarama Rao actually met him. And Fabian Bowers, uh, what, he was the ADC to MacArthur, but he single-handedly saved Kabuki, which is something even the Japanese admit from destruction. Um, because he was very against American censorship and he really fought for Japanese cultural traditions. So people admired him as somebody who could stand up to authority and he, be, he even resigned from his commission to uh, General MacArthur, who we didn't think of very highly. So Fabian Bowers was the best person to send to Russia. His, uh, his Russian wasn't perfect, but it was good. He understood Russian, he knew Russian history. He was writing a book on Skriabin. Um, and the way when he traveled to the Soviet Union, he traveled not as a tourist, but he obviously had entry to the highest reaches of the Soviet government and the Soviet Minister of Culture was very, uh, became his friend. And so Shandarama Rao initially, I felt, traveled to um, the Soviet Union as part of the Eisenhower um, Cold War cultural exchange. And I assume she went as his wife. And again, I was mistaken. So this whole thing, uh, my whole presentation is about the many parts of, of research. Um, I dug a little deeper and then I realized that uh, Fabian Bowers was sent as a cultural expert. But then I realized that Rao was a very important part of this equation. She was sent by Holiday Magazine, which is a brand new magazine that was created. It was really travel literature for the jet set. 
Um, it had small circulation. It wasn't a popular magazine, but very eminent American writers um, were paid very well to write for this holiday magazine. So it wasn't just travel, uh, uh, travel logs, it was travel literature. And Shantarama Rao had been recruited because she had already published three very well received novels and Holiday Magazine thought that she would be somebody important to also show American cosmopolitanism, right? So part of the Cold War offensive was not just about American identities, but American identity as a cosmopolitan um, world traveler who could write for the American elite. And because of who Shantarama Rao was, she became the perfect person to write this book. And her book, uh, um, her book, My Russian Journey, was very well reviewed in the United States, even though, you know, some Cold Warriors said uh, she's too friendly with the Russians, but the most part, it was, a, it was a very popular book. So what did Rao portray when she traveled with her husband? her uh, African-American nanny for her child, Ruth Cam. So she, this family became an epitome of American affluence, American leisure, and American culture. They did not go through the interest, um, although they had an interest guide, um, pretty much they were unsupervised. They stayed at the Metropole in Leningrad. They stayed at the Astoria in Moscow. So these were obviously, even though, they were not wealthy by American standards, they projected wealth in Russia. And they projected the fact that you could just take time off. Everyone kept asking her, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, I'm just here for fun. And that idea is so strange for her Soviet audience that one could just travel for fun. But this is what the United States was trying to project in the 1950s and the 1960s, that America was such a wealthy nation that its uh, citizens could travel abroad just for fun. Now, um, the connections with the Soviet elite and Forbian Bowers was really given access to um, the head of the Bolshoi um, and to many, many cultural organizations. He was given access to the archives and the Soviet Union in turn facilitated the, the very good book that he wrote on Soviet ballet. How am I doing on time, Olga? Am I good? Uh, seems like uh, 10 minutes left yeah. now. Oh, uh, yes, right. yes, it's okay. Is it right, Pika? Yes, 10 minutes. Uh -huh. Okay, mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. I will definitely finish in 10 minutes. So um, here I just want to mention a few things, um, Russia through Rao's eyes, because obviously she has these two identities as a transnational Indian cosmopolitan and as a representation of cosmopolite and as a represent, representation of American cosmopolitanism. Um, so what does she write about? Um, and I'll just talk about a few things, not too much. One is of course Leningrad and Pushkin, right? Um, she's, uh, she finds it interesting that after the Second World War, um, so much money has been spent in restoring the aristocratic and the czarist St. Petersburg, right? And, and she's surprised that of all the areas that are bombed, that Peterhof looks beautiful, um, Armitage looks fantastic, the Winter Palace looks like no war had happened. And then when she comes to Moscow, she goes to Kamovniki, right? She goes to uh, Tolstoy's home and uh, she reads it as this place of this living legend of Tolstoy. So it's not a dead place, it's a place where the spirit of Tolstoy is still alive. She meets Anna Kalma, who I, I don't know who she was. Um, she was a very um, popular writer. And again, I don't know, I have to read her works. But Anna Kalma takes her home and Rao sees the very elite lifestyles of the cultural elite of the Soviet Union. The fact that she has a three bedroom house on the embankment, that she has a full time maid, she has a country estate, she serves her cherry wine that was made on the estate. And, um, and Rao is very interested in the fact that, the, that by 19, uh, late 1950s, the Soviet cultural elite has very bourgeois ways. At the same time, she's also very interested in 
the everyday life of the Soviet Union. And in, in Leningrad, she goes looking for Dostoevsky's apartment and nobody will let her go. Svetlana from the interview said, you know, why are you interested in Dostoevsky? And she says, I'm very interested, I want to see. And then finally she and her husband find the apartment. As we know, Dostoevsky was not important in the Soviet Union. Um, his literature was considered too negative. She finds the apartment and she finds the three women who live there. And in the descriptions, and there is a long American tradition of describing um, Russian poverty and Soviet material poverty. And this is where Rao really challenges this. And she reads it not through American standards, but through Indian standards. And so in her writing, the ordinary people and their aspirations for material comfort, this then becomes something that is tied to who she is as an Indian woman abroad. The last two um, things before I, um, I wrap up is that throughout the book, she's very interested in Russian nationalism and not Soviet internationalism, but Russian nationalism. And she keeps thinking about the fact that the Russians have been attacked through many centuries, but have held on to their Russian identity. Whereas she says in India, the many waves of conquest, um, Indians have amalgamated the conquerors, um, but that Indian nationalism is a work in progress, whereas Russian nationalism is a reality. And I thought that was very interesting. And finally, um, she meets many women, I think like her mother in the Soviet Union, um, hardworking, high achieving women. And uh, she is a little bit critical of them. And who she's looking for is the young Soviet woman who also knows how to dress well, how to talk nicely, how to have fun, people like herself. And um, so you see her interest in this new Soviet woman. Um, I will end, I think I have a few minutes, is that Rao's Indian identity also comes out in the text. And so she talks about the fact that, you know, the first night she gets to Moscow, the Indian ambassador, KPS Menon, is her father's friend. So her first night she's invited to a dinner with Eleanor Roosevelt, who just happens to be visiting Russia at that time. So her elite connections come out very quickly. She wears the Indian sari, she wears it to the Bolshoi theater and she feels she's very overdressed. And her son with his beautiful black eyes everywhere, the Russians love him. Um, she also talks about the fact that many ordinary Russians come up to her and say Hindi Rusi Bhai Bhai, which was a, a term that Jawaharlal Nehru came up with, which literally meant um, friendship or brotherhood. And she's very interested in Asia and Russian art. So from Pushkin to Glinka, she's very interested at that how many times Asia comes up in Russian art. So she's trying to figure out Russian identity. And finally, um, this is, I think, something that she doesn't really develop, but she is very interested in comparing Russian nationalism with the Indian experiencing experience of amalgamating the colonizers. Okay, my lead. Um, I will stop over there and I hope I finished in time. And uh, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. 